Let's go ahead and bring in Steiner Sports CEO, Brandon this Steiner. One of the country's top this memorabilia moguls. I have an unbelievable guest, Brandon Steiner. Brandon's second to none. Michael Lombardi is your guy. He's my guest today. We're going to talk everything football, behind the scenes, Patriots, Belichick, Parcells. I, I think we have an open forum here. Absolutely. Whatever you want to talk about. Al Davis. We can talk about everything. Well, first, let's talk about Gridiron Genius. Why, why that book and who's that book for? Uh, you know, first of all, why the book? I've been blessed in my career to work for really truly some of the geniuses of the game from I start out as a young kid working for Bill Walsh driving him around in his brand new Porsche to uh, being with Bill Belichick the first time he got a head coaching job uh, to then being with Al Davis for over 10 years and then reunited back with Belichick so I've you spent some time with Al Davis 10 years 10 wow. years wow and, and, and I lived to talk about it too how's that yeah but is it is it hyped up more than it should be or was no, that it was look, that better I, than what you think better well, than what most people think you know i think it was a little bit of both uh I, I was driving bill one day in his car and he said you know the most football i ever learned in my life was working for al davis and as a young kid i was 25 at the time i said well i'm gonna work for al davis one day and so i did and i learned a lot of football there's no doubt i learned a lot of football from belichick i've been friends with parcells i've never actually worked for bill but i've been friends with parcells for a long time i learned a lot from him so that's why i felt like writing the book because there's a lot of experiences that i was fortunate enough to share and then also you know the book's really for the book serves two purposes it's for anybody who loves football that's a any coach of any sport it really doesn't matter this book applies to any, every sport it's a it's a it's a it speaks a language regardless of sport and then i think it's a book about leadership management and culture particularly which evolves on wall street so to me my audience is wall street coaches of any sport your big takeaway in the book if i read that book was there something that really jumps out at you that would surprise us uh yeah it's culture culture matters I think it's the number Bill one. Bill Walsh was big on that. That's all Bill Walsh was about was culture. People think he was the West Coast offense, but culture is all what it matters. Belichick's culture. But people think Belichick is a tactician. He is. They think he's a drill sergeant. He's not. He's a culture builder. He builds, he establishes, he maintains and drives culture every single day in the building. So when they say the Patriot way, they're really saying culture. Same thing with Bill Walsh. I talk about it in the book. Standard of excellence with Bill Walsh was about his 17 core principles that he believed the organization should adhere to and I write about it and one of them for example was the PA announcer at Candlestick Park uh, you know was not doing his job right and Bill got me on the headset and said hey remind me on Monday when we get back to the office I need to fire the PA announcer and so Monday morning I sheepishly went up to him and said coach you wanted me to remind you about the PA announcer he said yeah he's just not behaving in the way I need him to I need to talk to him so he was all about culture for everybody not just Montana but for everyone receptionist everybody stationary everybody. parking everybody yeah I, I, I read a book that he had written right before he had passed the score takes care of itself yeah I mean if you're in a leadership that's that is that your book a little that's my book that, too, but a little yeah, that, wider with a whole bunch of different really, personalities yeah. and how Walsh and Belichick are similar even though Bill was always dressed pristine with with you know the most perfect cotton pants and the most clean sneakers of all time, and Belichick can look a little shabby at times, but at the end of the day, they're they get to the same place. It's all about the culture within the building and how culture will drive the organization, not what other th happens around it. Tell me about Parcells a little bit because you know we have a lot of giant fans that watch this and and <laughs> what do you think the secret to his sauce was um you hear a lot of different stories obviously there was this love affair so to speak a love hate affair with his players uh but he knew how to motivate but was there more than that oh there's way more than bill, bill first of all bill you know bill's the son of a banker but bill's really smart i mean don't ever underestimate bill's level of intellect he's not a gym teacher coach with a whistle no disrespect to gym teachers he's a real smart man and what bill can do is what al davis often said was he could anticipate things really well so he understood that today's goal isn't just to beat the redskin today's goal is to beat the to become the champion and he knew how to plan and he could see the game from 30,000 feet and he understood it and he also knew how to build a team he wasn't just about collecting talent he knew how to build a team 
And so a lot of the things we did in Cleveland were really derivatives of Parcells, which he learned a lot from Al Davis as well, because he spent one year out of football uh, when he got fired at Air Force. He spent working for the Raiders as a scout. So he learned from Al Davis. So there's a lot of similarities there. But It's a small club. It's a really small club. And I think you can learn that in my book that there's very few teams that do it this way. You know, I think Sean Payton's benefited from being with Parcells. That's why he's such a good coach. And where John Gruden perhaps may not become the same level as Sean Payton because he's never been around a guy like Bill Parcells. Can you coach and GM? Can that even exist? Because you see a bunch of guys that have taken that on and not done particularly well. Is it too much for one person? Well, or? it is if you don't do the job, if you don't do both jobs. You can't half-ass both jobs. you got to do both jobs exactly. Belichick spends most of May, June, July, and August working as the GM. He's preparing for the draft. And then he'll work and prepare for his team. I mean, he, he methodically breaks down his day into, I'm the head coach, but I'm also the GM of the team. And so he can foresee things that happens. He works diligently at that. But it's a challenge. You have to be able to see the game from a higher level. You can't, you know, coaches' jobs are to win the next week. The leader's job is to win the, the title. And how do we do that? And I think Bill's able to differentiate the two. So you're able to kind of break, is the book broken down into different uh, Bro- segments? The book's broken down into, not, into all different chapters. First, obviously, it talks about culture. It talks about what it takes to win. It talks about Pars, uh, Bel- Walsh and Belichick. It talks about Al Davis. So then I go into offensive theory, defensive theory, special teams, how special teams really creates the all-in, the butterfly effect for your football team. You know, when you want the team to buy in, and be a team, you can't just say, no, well, these guys can't play special teams because they're too valuable. You know, so you have to create a special unit. And I talk about the future of football, and I talk about one week with Belichick uh, inside as we're preparing for the Baltimore Raven playoff game. Uh, it takes fans deep inside of where how Belichick operates. So if you're a football fan, you're going to love this book because you can go well, past what you're seeing on TV or even if you're at yeah, the game. Yeah, there's no doubt. And it talks about my pet peeves. Like, for example, people that call timeout with 205 to go in a, in a game. It's the dumbest call of all time because right. if I need the ball back and I call t- timeout at 205, I've given you the right to run or pass. But if I wait till two minutes, then you can only run the ball. So it goes over all my pet peeves about football. Got a couple others? That's like don't eat ballpark before. Ballpark food like before ballpark. the end of the first quarter, though. Yeah. <laughs> no, we had to have the yeah. first quarter, but it's left over from the game My before. My other one is p- teams that throw check downs in two minute drill. Like it's the worst play you can throw in two minute drill. Everybody's obsessed with a completion. Everybody's obsessed with getting the first down. Who cares about the first down? We got to get in the field goal range. We got to get a touchdown. So you have to throw the ball down the field. And if you throw a check down and you eat up 40 seconds, to do that, people think you've ate up 40 seconds. No, you've eaten six plays. You've given six plays to the defense because every play is worth six seconds. So you can't think a two-minute drive as two minutes. You have to think of it as in terms of how many plays do we have to execute. So it's things like that. You think a lot of coaches are thrown into it too fast? Way too fast, yeah. I think, you, you see know, look, now more like more of that, but, but maybe more coaches – it just seems like more coaches can't hang in for the there, longevity. There's no apprenticeship anymore, right? You so you, you you're moving up. We're in a younger generation. It's the, you know, we want to hire a young person. There's a great book, Wisdom at Work. It talks about how sometimes experience does matter. And I think in my book, you can see that Walsh struggled to become a head coach. Well into his late 40s, did he get his first head coaching interview? It's remarkable. It's you know? incredible. And he and he went to become a head coach because he wanted to learn how to be a head coach himself. He knew there was no schools to go to. It's the same thing with Belichick. He's the defense coordinator of the best team in football, the New York Giants. And it took the not. It wasn't until his second Super Bowl win as the coordinator that he got his first interview. That doesn't happen today. Wow. That doesn't happen today. So we're in such a wow. rush. And then the owners are wondering why one-third of the workforce gets fired every single year. One-third of the NFL workforce. It can't be healthy. No, of course it's not. For the players, not. for the league. And for... it's not a culture-based system because you're not, you're not, you can't develop a culture in, three year, in two years. You can't do it. But it seems like the teams that win seem to manage to hold on to their coaches for a long period of time. Right. Pittsburgh. Belichick, being Peyton with New Orleans. It yeah, no, they right. do. Well, because, what you know, in 1984, I was my first year in the National Football League. I was running around the draft room, and uh, we were we did everything in one day. And, and Walsh says to me, what are, you, what are you upset about, Michael? And I said, well, you know, the Falcons drafted this guy and that guy. And he said, look, we're only competing against eight teams. So when the Redskins do something, remind me. When the Giants do something, remind me. I'm only worried about eight teams. Everybody else, 
you could forget about him. And he was right. And today, that was when we had 28 teams in the league. Today we have 32, and there's still only eight teams you're competing That's against. That's a great way of looking at it. When you think about when you think about your experiences, that I just go back to Al Davis for a minute here because, I mean, it's such a huge icon. You know, when you think about everything he did, um, what was what was some of the best lessons you learned from him, and what was the, maybe what, what do you think about his legacy? I don't what think he, he gets he enough credit for. I mean, you're a marketing guy, right? I don't think Al Davis gets enough credit for branding. Al Davis was obsessed with the brand of the Raiders. He wanted you to always refer to the Raiders as the Raiders. The was in front of it. Always the. Like the President of the United States. The White House. He wanted it to be the Raiders. He wanted that moniker. He took you collect, you, you do an unbelievable sports memorabilia business. He took the Detroit Lions silver and the West Point Army Knights and he combined those two colors together and he made the Raiders. Literally? Literally. And he made the Raiders silver and black. He wanted to be the Brooklyn Dodgers. The first one to bring the black right. and make it cool, right? right. Nobody right. else really nobody, had that, right? Nobody had it. He made the Brooklyn Dodgers. He wanted to be the Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Yankees. He wanted to have the speed of the Brooklyn Dodgers and the power of the Yankees on his team. He loved George Weiss, the general manager of the New York Yankees. He That was his idol. And, you know, we and George Weiss never allowed female traveling secretaries at the Raiders. There was no females involved in the football end of the building. There was a Obviously, there we had a female president, but she wasn't involved in the football end. So, from a marketing and branding standpoint, brilliant. And then his knowledge of the game was incredible. His game management, his ability to understand situational football is why Parcells was so good. It's why Walsh was so good. It's why Belichick's so good. We all learned it through his game. Like, I'll give you an example. I was laughing about this on my podcast. Last week, the Chiefs played the Ravens. And uh, the Chiefs threw the ball 53 times. Wow. Okay? How many holding calls do you think the Chiefs had in the game? Three. Not a holding call was against the Chiefs the whole day. Now, that would have drove Al Davis crazy. But, see, that's something that nobody wants to talk about on television. Like, no, it doesn't dawn on anybody, but Al's brilliance was to be able to find those things that really matter and focus on it. And he taught us a lot of football. I mean, there's a lot of football. You have 53 passes. You don't get called for a holding call. That's Somebody's amazing. missing something. That's amazing. So, so is that he be on the coach? He would be on the officials. He would think he was somebody who was out to get him. Yeah. You know, I mean, but, but more than anything, he was he he taught me about personnel, how to set up a personnel department, how to define what you want to be. Every organization wants to be something. Your company wants to stand for something. You know, the Raiders were size and speed. People think scouting is about finding talent. It's not. It's about eliminating talent. You want to eliminate what you don't want. If a, if a corner ran 4-6, he was never going to play for the Raiders. I didn't care. He wanted fast guys. So, you know, it, scouting's about eliminating, and that's so what he knew he, what he wanted. He knew exactly what he wanted to look good getting off the bus. Give me your Mount Everest. In, do you have a Mount Everest as far as coaches? Of, of? Well, it starts really. I mean, look, I've worked for two of the greatest of all time. I, I was, you know, I learned from Walsh. I knew nothing when I got to the San Francisco. I knew absolutely nothing when I got to San Francisco. I thought I knew everything. I knew nothing. And I learned a lot, coach driving Bill and working around Bill and having a draft in 1986 where we basically – got Hall of, a Hall of Fame player in the fourth round and got seven starters that won three more Super Bowls. So that was a great, great opportunity. But, I mean, there's there really the, the world, the coaching world is one name. It's Bill Belichick. I mean, there's nobody, there's no better coach in it. The any. GOAT. So you, 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 if you got one coach, you're taking Bill. It's not even, it's not close. Not even close. It's not even close. I mean, it's, you know, his, his ability to prepare a team, to motivate a team, to build a culture. He's a CEO. He can pick the players. I mean, it's just, he's truly, he's truly the greatest coach of all time. And in the book, I write about it. In 1996, I got fired. We all got fired in Cleveland when he moved the team. When Art Modell moved the team, how do you explain what happened in Cleveland? This well, we went, we went, we went uh, 11 and five after four years. We won the last playoff game they've ever had in Cleveland, and then the next year, the man moved the team, and the city of Cleveland revolted against us. So that year, I wrote a. I the, the Los Angeles Rams asked me to write a book. They were the St. Louis Rams at the time. They wanted me to write a coaching book about what it takes to be a great head coach. And I broke it, and they wanted me to spend months on it, spend months on it. Three months, we'll pay you for it, which they never did, which was great because I le- a great lesson, right? And I learned that- What was the lesson? Oh, there's yeah. four areas that make a great coach. 
and I put them in the book. It's called the command of the room, which means the coach comes in and he can command the room. He's got he's got a plan to tell everybody, and then it's command of the message, which he can explain the plan to people, right? And then the next area is command of trust. Do you trust him to be consistent with everybody in the organization? And then the last is command of self. Is he going to be critical of himself when he makes a mistake? Coaches that were good in three of those four were always successful. Coaches that were good in two of the four always failed. Belichick's great in all four. So was Walsh. And so I used that platform. And when I wrote recommendations for the Rams in 1996, and I still have the book today, I said, you should hire Bill Belichick as your head coach, or you should hire Nick Saban. Because both those men have these four qualities, and they'll do them very well. Now, Nick was the head coach at Michigan State at the time. He didn't have it. They laughed at me. They said, we just had Rich Brooks as our coach. We don't want another college coach. They so. up hiring, is that when they hired That's Dick That's when they hired McMill. Very good, yeah. yeah. Dick Which also, by the way, you can make an argument would hit all four of those. Would do Because he was special. Absolutely, at least, yeah. at least it seemed to be. Yeah, at no, that he time, did. it seemed like it all came together I don't together think there's him. ever been a coach who sustained success that's the key word, sustained success. Some guys can win a Super Bowl. You can peak. You know, some guys can make a million dollars, but can they maintain a million dollars? You know, can they maintain it? Can they keep it? Sustainability is really important. Yeah, I call it, you know, the mental stamina, you know, to, to go from just successful to significant. Right. You know, to, and, then, and then even if you got the real stamina, extraordinary. That's really good. That's really you good. Know what yeah. I mean? So, you know, the success, the significance, and then you go to extraordinary, which is what you really want when you start talking about a Belichick and a Walsh who on top of the mountain because right. they not only did it, but they did it for a long time. Consistency over time equals credibility. That's our mantra here. Yep. That's everything. Um, it's just hard to imagine that, like, Belichick was our assistant coach on the bill. Do you think hiring good talent, like, Bill always had good assistant coaches? Bill always, Walsh had good assistant yeah, coaches? Yeah, well, well they, they, they developed their coaches, yeah. right? So look at Parcells' model of who he wanted. Charlie Weiss didn't even play college football. He wanted smart guys who had some military background in them. Belichick was at Navy. He wanted smart guys that understood how to be in a culture that could accept team that built with team you know and the same thing with bill walsh bill walsh sent me to the airport to go pick up sherman lewis and sherman lewis was the defensive coordinator of the of the uh he was the defensive coordinator of the michigan state spartans he just gotten fired and i said coach why am i picking up this defensive coordinator to be the running back coach he said i don't need people to tell me what to do i need people to do what i tell them to do and he developed coaches that way and that's really what belichick does that's what parcells started doing and that's why they're so successful. Because what's a leader? A leader develops people around them, right? Yeah. And that's what they do. I agree with that 100%. What are you seeing now in the NFL? Moving the Patriots aside, which is insane. The run, and, and it's just incredible. But wh what else do you see? What else do you like? Well, there's things I like. I mean, I think this the, there is the, the, the adaptability of the league is something you have to like. I think there's a this is a time where we have a lot of talented young quarterbacks, and I think it's fun for the league. I think Parcells has a line that we can only develop what the colleges give us, and they're giving us a lot of quarterbacks that can throw the ball, which is great. The, what I don't like is we've lost the head coach. The, the, the Parcells, the Gibbs, those those guys are dinosaurs anymore. We don't have that. We have subcontractors. We Why? Have, because it's because the owners want to be able to control it more, and so if they have a subcontractor as a head coach and they have a defense coordinator on offense, then every you have a committee. And my theory is, look, they've never dedicated a monument to a committee. That's true, right? So you know, this ain't the Dave Clark Five. It's a paramilitary structure, and you got to have that. And unfortunately, the the owners don't really always want that. They want. I think we have the defense thing. There's a lot of complaints now that defense is you know taking away so many different things the defense could do. Touching, hitting, uh, is the defense now is it just an offensive game? Well, you, no, I think it's still a defensive game, but it's now a situational defensive game. So there's like nine categories of defense you have to excel in. You can't play great defense from the time the ball gets kicked off until the last whistle. You, nobody's going to shut you out. But you got to play really good in two-minute drill. you got to play good at the end of both halves. You have to play good on third down in the red zone. You have to play good on third down, period. You have to play really good on the red zone all over. You can't give up big plays. So there's nine categories that you have to play good in defense. That's what you have to focus and practice on. The idea we have to stop the run, well, nobody runs the ball anymore. Nobody runs the ball, and if you run the ball, you're doing me a favor because you'll just you'll just kick field goals. You won't score touchdowns. I always talk about in life, you know, you get to halftime, and you know, it's, you know, you're, if you're let's say 40 years old, you're probably at halftime. Do you stop? Can you make the adjustments? 
how big is halftime in football? Um, and and what, is, is it chaos in, in halftime, or can you make a lot of adjustments? But it seems like a lot of teams can come back in the second half, play all, an entirely different game, and win. Particularly, I, I noticed Belichick's a great halftime coach. So I think what you have to do in the first quarter, you have to what Belichick tries to do in the first quarter. He's in a mad dash to figure out for all three phases, offense, defense, and, and the kicking game, is what we practiced and what we planned for actually going to happen. And if it's not, then we have to adjust right now. And then we'll go into halftime and make that adjustment. And we'll do it in the second quarter, but at halftime we need to fix it. And then there's always – you have to think of the game in four quarters. So there's always something you want to save offensively, defensively, and in the special teams for the, thir for the third quarter. So they can't adjust. So you want to start new in the second half. You want to do something – you can't just – lay everything out yeah. there in the first quarter and expose yourself and have nothing left. Pace yourself, have something left. Great coaches understand that. And it's like basketball coaches. They know how to make those adjustments, yeah. And I think that's the key to football. Football's a game of adjustments. Everybody has good plans. But as Mike Tyson once famously said, you know, everybody has a plan until they get hit in the mouth. And until they get punched in the face. Do you think that – have you ever been in a halftime where, where – what was the most miraculous halftime you can remember, or the best halftime situation you can remember? You was know, it the twenty-eight-three. You know that 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 always is, but there was never any reaction. There was never you never you don't look at the score. You just look at what you have to do. What was going on in that game? I mean, can you give me a little bit of a sense because it's shocking. Well, I think what Bill said is true. I think that he, there's two things when you watch a game. You're never there's the score and then who's in control. Okay, so there's the scoreboard, and then who's really in control of the game? And as he said later, I never felt like Atlanta was in control of the game. I thought they were in the lead, but I never thought they were in control of the game. And I think as a coach, you got to figure out which is which. If you're in control and you're in the lead, you're in good shape. But if you're in control, if you're in the lead but not in control, you can't. You have to adjust your plan. I think those are two different. I think that game's the perfect example of it. So I feel in my marriage. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I feel like I'm in the lead, but I clearly know I'm not in control. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. We, exactly. All, we both do it. Yeah, I join you on that. Good. Are you, any experiences with any halftime? Are there halftime speeches or the teams really divide the up? The teams and, are divided. And it's not just, like that, right? No, no. it's it's not like good women for the Gipper. It's divided. Then you come back together and say, hey, here's what we got to do. We got to play better. Put the first half behind you. Let's go and play, and play better in the second half. Everything you do for practice, everything you do for the game is done in practice. You got practice is how practice, so practice is important. You know the, the the key statement is is practice execution becomes game reality. Let's just go back to what we did in practice. How important is the draft, and how hard is it drafting these days? So much pressure, hype. I cannot believe what the NFL has created and ESPN too oh. around. Yeah. The draft. I mean, it, it's almost like a it's almost like a season in itself. I went Is to it too much pressure on this? Well, I went to Hofstra, and I used to I'd get up early in the morning on draft day, and I would take the subway, I would take the train, a Long Island Railroad in, and stand in line because there was only 500 seats at the Sheridan to see the draft. Now it's a a billion dollar industry. So there's that. There's the business of the draft. the The hardest part about the draft is not evaluating the players. That's not the hard part. The hard part is evaluating the character. Who is this kid I'm dealing with? Who is this guy? Where is he from? What makes him? I'm a white kid from New Jersey. How do I understand an African-American kid from the inner city? How do I get that? How do I understand his plight? If I judge him through my eyes, then I'm going to be wrong. I, I, do I need to live his life? I need to live and understand a kid from Samoa and understand what he's all about. I need to understand what some Mexican immigrants about. So it's a really about trying to understand the cultures of the society that you're in to really understand what, what you're dealing with. And the line that we always used is past performance predicts future achievement. So if you ask a kid so about... So the player tells you who they are, believe them? If, if they can give you an example... Like, tell me what's the number one thing you've ever had to do to overcome in your life. You know, like, give me an example of something that you thought to deal with in your life that you had to overcome, you know, and then you move on from there. And then based on their answers, you get a better idea. If you ask general questions, you're going to get general answers. If somebody said, this guy's really smart to you, and then you came back and said, give me three examples of what makes him smart. You'll know if he's smart or not. That's true. Why was Parcells so good at the draft, though? It seemed like he was a master at it. Because he understood, like Walsh, they they both understood what they wanted. So when character when the, guys, 
Well, they had, but they had a profile for every player. You know, when the FBI is looking for serial killers, they don't open up the phone book and start looking, right? <laughs> they have a phone book. They have a profile of what they want for each thing. And Parcells was exactly with that. He wanted this linebacker to be this size. He wanted this offensive lineman to have this type of intelligence. Everything was defined down to the last point. And then now, when you take that, you go out and look for people that fit that criteria. We were talking about this the other day, so just going on a little bit of a tangent, a little bit off your book, actually, but the greatest quarterback of all time, and, we, you know, we, we play around with Montana, Brady, but the greatest defensive player of all time. Can you, can you make that? Is, is, is there such a person or one or two oh, people? I think it's Lawrence Taylor. I don't think there's anybody who's different. Than, the greatest know. defensive player of all time. I don't see he couldn't – nobody could block him one-on-one. He played the game with incredible passion. He and intelligence. He disrupted the game. He was, I mean, he was a threat. He could do things in the passing game. He could do things, I mean, I asked Belichick, you know, I, you probably have a picture of him and Parcells on the sideline when they're at the Giants. Belichick's in a starter jacket and B Parcells is in an apex jacket. That was when the sideline was available for everybody, you know, until Jerry Jones took the sideline back over. Uh, and I used to say, Bill, you know, you don't even have a play sheet for your defense. He said, I got Lawrence Taylor. What do I need a play sheet for? He's right. Because he would coach. He was always a coach on the field, too, in a lot of ways. Yeah, I mean, Lawrence was – but Lawrence was really smart. He understood it. But, God, he played the game with incredible passion. And he was, you know – I mean, he turned games around. Look, if you didn't block him with, with a lot of people, you were going to get beat. You had a plan for him. There's no You question. had a double plan for him. Yeah. Now, what's what's next for you? Are you, you know, you got obviously you're rock and roll with a book, which I wish you a lot of luck. But are you going to go back into? No, I'm done. I think age. I'm I'm, I'm probably not age uh, uh, worthy. appropriate. Yeah, age appropriate. Yeah, for the <laughs> NFL. And I know, and you know, they don't want. They want yes men. They don't want somebody who's going to challenge them. I don't think that's the. She, we won't see you on. Uh, on in no, a, I, in a, I mean, I have a good. A, I like. I do my podcast. I write for the Athletic, which is fun, and I'm hopefully going to write another book. I like to I like to be thought of as a writer now. So you're into journalism? I love it. Yeah, I do. Because I, I think you know when you learn when you can teach something to somebody that you know, you become better at what you know. What's up? With, where, first of all, where do we find the pod? And where, where's the? I'm on the Ringer Podcast Network, which is Bill Simmons. The Ringer, which is a website. Uh, it's your so, big time, man. No, I don't know about yeah, that. Yeah, we love Bill Simmons' stuff. Bill it's Simmons great. is yeah, good. Yeah, he yeah, does so a great I job. Do that. I do, it's called it's called GM Street. It's on the uh, Ringer's Podcast Network. I, I'm there. And I write for The Athletic, which is a, a subscription-based newspaper yeah. out of San Francisco, which is tremendous. It's hot. Yeah, a lot of it's people really, talk about The Athletic. The Athletic's great. I think no, there's no ads on it. It's really good. There's no pop-ups. It's it's really good. It's, it's great special. writing, and you can really – for me, it's enjoyable because I can write about the sport I love. And the way you want it. Yes. On the, on the Bill Simmons podcast, like who are some of the guests? Like what, what I don't do of? guests. We just – me and this kid, Tate Frazier, he's a young kid from the University You're just of breaking Northcott. stuff down? We talk about last year on Tuesday. We do air one on Tuesday where we break the league down. We take five topics in the league and break them all down. And then on Friday, we take the games coming up on the week and we pick the games. And hopefully, I give enough winners out there. People keep coming back. I love which it. Been pretty good. And that's everything now because Lord knows. Well, betting is everything. I mean, I do. A, I do a Vegas show and on Saturday and Sunday out of the Ocean's Casino in, in Atlantic City on Vegas Sports and Information Network, which is a lot of fun and it's great because it's not. It's no longer taboo. It's really like we're like a blue. Bloomberg's news show so you're just telling the fans that here's if you want to vet this stock if you want to bet Atlanta versus Green Bay before you put any money on Atlanta you should know Matt Ryan when he plays in temperature under 40 degrees does this this and this and his win percentage in under 40 degrees is this you know so if you're willing to do that if you know that and you I'm not telling you to bet Atlanta I'm just telling you you should know this same thing with Bloomberg News they don't tell us to to buy Apex stock they tell us here's the here's the valuation of it and here's the situation it's not taboo but anymore do you think like when you get back to your book right and, and one of the benefits was you have that kind of knowledge. You're able to look a little deeper, maybe and not even analytics and stats, but you're looking at culture. You're looking at certain things, the way they're playing out. That could give you a little bit of a sway to go one way or the other. Oh, absolutely. Based on all the other facts you have. Right, because you look when you when you're you because coaches, it's a matchup between two coaches, right? So what coach do you like? How do you who's going to adjust? Who's a really good coach? And Belichick versus John D. Filippo, the Minnesota Vikings. Which way are you going on that one? And I'm taking Belichick, you know. Uh, who? What are you going to do? So it's all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Are you taking Brady, by the way, in your first pick? Or are you taking <laughs> Montana? You've seen them all up close. Well, look, I, you know, it's funny. I, 
uh, Drew was taking me around here, and I saw Montana signatures, and I, you know, I could still ask, I could still oh. ask Joe the very first time in 1984 for a signature, and it, it still looks the same here in your building as it did when he signed it for me. I love Joe, and I love Tommy. Special, I both love Tommy. special, and, you know, human a, beings. I mean, just special they, human the, the Tom, way they carry themselves. Tom Brady, the, the is, whole feel. Is, Tom Brady is an incredible human being, as is Joe. You know, if I text either one today, they'll get back to you. They're really nice people. Yeah, Joe, Joe's, Joe, I mean, people forget the 49ers a little bit. They're kind of run. The, 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 it was like a Yankee, New York Yankee. He was so dominant. Dominant. People forget, too, that Joe was recruited to play basketball. Could have gone to North Carolina State to play basketball. Chose to go to Notre Dame, but had an offer to go to NC State. When NC State was really a good basketball, not that they're not now. Yeah, but yeah. They were. Joe was a fabulous athlete. A fabulous athlete, and I tell the story in the book of how Bill found him and and uh, got him. So it was really, it's it's. Um, I love him. How can you pick him? I won two Super Bowl. I won Super Bowls with both players. We'll post a link for uh, Gridiron Genius right underneath. There. If you click, you want to buy it. I assume Amazon's probably the best. Amazon, place. Barnes and Noble. You can buy it at any online retailer. And this is your I first was, book. This is my first book, and I was oh, in Manhattan boy. today. I was so excited. I saw it at the Amazon store on Thirty uh, Seventh Street. So I was happy about that. So, so somebody helped you get in the Amazon store because it's not easy to get in. There's so many books. That's great. But there's uh, something you know. I love this because football junkies. And there are so many of them. You know, we have Anita Marks coming here, giving odds for games, and we we try to mix it in because it's it our our fans love. Yeah, they want to know fantasy. They want to know odds. They want to know now with all these prop bets. Are oh, you yeah. a fan of the prop bet? Oh, I am. I mean, look, I do a, I do a show every week. I think that you know you have to do your homework on the prop bets. I mean, last week if you would have taken some of those prop bets, you would have gotten beaten bad. There's a guy in Vegas called. Uh, uh, he, he's called uh, Duffel Bag Boy. He was walking around Vegas with a duffel bag full of about, uh, a, really, 100,000. He was playing parlays like crazy. And then eventually it caught up to him, and now he's no longer in Vegas anymore. I don't know where he is. It happens. I've yeah, they, seen, don't build those, seen... they don't build those casinos because they're losing money. No, and, uh, exactly. And you better be prepared to lose uh, because that's more than likely what's going to happen. Exactly. But, but on the sports betting, it will be interesting to see what direction all this goes in. Are you... Is, have you got a surprise in your bag of tricks that we th could see now at this end of the season? Because I think Baltimore's like... a dangerous team. I think Still? Balti I think Baltimore's a really good team. They play good defense. This Lamar Jackson's really tough to tackle. I think he they're going to be a tough out in the playoffs. You, so you may, you may see them in the Super Bowl? I think they could be a tough out. I think Kansas – I mean, look, they gave Kansas City everything they wanted in overtime on the road. Hard to do in Kansas City. Have you ever been to Kansas City for a game? It's like I, going into Moscow. It's like yeah. going into downtown Moscow with all the red. You think you're in the red – you think you're in downtown Moscow with the red army around you. It's tough. It's a hard place to play. I think the Rams, I think the Saints, I love the Saints. But the Rams and Saints seem to be the favorites. Right, they are. But I think that I think what we saw last week in Atlanta gave the Saints all they could handle. The Rams got shut out basically at home uh, on the road to the Bears. I think the one thing is if the league stays exactly the way it is right now, these 12 teams that are quali right now that are technically in the playoffs, it'll be a great playoff run. Are the Cowboys uh, pretenders or contenders? I think it depends on who they play. I think it depends on who they play. I think that there's there's so not playing home. <laughs> I think there's a moment where they could be really good, but I also think there's a moment where they're just they could easily their defense is really good this year. They're fast, they're athletic, but I think when they play against if they play too much defense, if they play 28, 29 minutes of defense, I think they lose. You have Jerry Jones, Al Davis, and your Mount Rushmore of uh, owners. Well, I mean, look, I've been blessed. I think Eddie DeBarlow is the greatest owner I've ever worked for in my life. Why? Because uh, he was incredibly generous. I was my first Super Bowl. I was standing there with my parents, my late mother, and my father, who's a barber down in Ocean City, New Jersey, 91 years old. And he sees me standing there with him, and I was a nervous kid. I didn't, you know, and he comes up to me and he grabs the, my three tickets out of my hand and he says, Hey, here. And he takes three tickets out of his pocket and he gives them to me. He says, Your parents deserve to sit on the 50. And he gave me three 50 yard line tickets. He's the most, gen I mean, every. You know, he'd send flour. He was really just the most incredible owner I've ever been with. You never hear anybody say anything less than what you just told me. I mean, he's a he's gem. incredible. So he's, you got him in your Mount Rushmore. Oh, there's no doubt. He's the best. He's, I mean, of the owners that I worked for, I mean, you know, he was. I mean, Art Modell was, was always fun to work for, challenging. Al was challenging as an owner. Uh, but... Uh, you know, the, the, the owners, when they react to the newspapers, that's yeah, never that's, good. That's a disaster. Can Cleveland come back? Can Cleveland come out of this cave ever? 
and get out from underneath themselves. Well, I think Baker Mayfield will give him a good chance. I think Jimmy Haslam, the owner there, is new. I think he listens to too many people. But hopefully now with a quarterback and without Hugh Jackson, I think he's got a chance, yeah. So could we see the Cleveland in the playoffs maybe next year? I think year? we could, yeah. I think they could. I think they're, they're certainly much better. One last thing. Surprise pick come January. Who who, do we, who are we going to see maybe in an NFC, AFC championship game? If I had a surprise pick, I would say AFC championship, I would say Baltimore, Kansas City. That would be a surprise. A NFC, I would say Chicago, New Orleans. Do you like Chicago? Yeah, I, I don't like Mitchell Trubisky very much. I think he's too inaccurate, but I think their defense is really good. They seem like they got a chip, though. They do. They got a nasty little spell about them. Yeah, like, But, you know, they gave up 27 points when they came back to New York. I know everybody's talking about how great yeah. they are, but again, it comes back to... Maybe they weren't ready. Maybe they're were maybe they well, overlooking them, One thing, them, one of my pet peeves, uh, the book, the most important stat in football. Yeah. Nobody knows this. The most, the most important... important now, am I going to find this in, in, in Gridiron Genius? It's absolutely the Have most... Have you got a bunch of these things? So I'm reading this book, I'll, I'll sound like a genius if I go to a football absolutely game. Absolutely, you will. It, uh, I like that. The most important stat in football is first half point differential. Whoever, whoever leads at first half point differential is usually the best teams in the league. Last year it was it was the e, it was the New England Patriots and the Eagles. The year before it was the New England Patriots and the Falcons. First half point differential. Meaning who has who scored more than they gave up in the first half. So, so if you're winning at halftime, you have an 85% chance of winning the game because your defense can play more aggressively and your offense doesn't have to worry about catching up. That's smart. I love that. That's football genius, man. I gotta go. I gotta get thoroughly into your book because I'm not as intelligent as I, I want to be. I think. I uh, think. I hope you read it. I think it'll it'll help your company. It, it, it hopefully it'll help everyone. It's a good stocking stuffer too. I like that. Good good Father's Day gift. Just good football fan gift. Good gift for the coach. Thank you, my friend. We don't. You know, we last time we had uh, last person we had was also a great guest, uh, Merrill Hodge. Yeah, and, sure. Uh, I, I, I ask one more thing. Merrill Hodge sat here maybe what a month ago, Drew. And said, I don't know if the football injuries are all what they're cracked up to be. He made a very serious argument saying that that maybe there's a little bit of some misunderstanding and, 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 and maybe the stats aren't all football related that cause football head drama and injuries and that could be prevented. Are you a fan of that? Maybe it's overplayed and over dramatized. That I think it's something we have to look at because look, there's a lot of guys that played a lot of football that didn't seem to have all this. I'm not going to dismiss it, but I'm also I think it's something we need to look into, and I think the owners are putting money into it. Yeah, there's no doubt it has it's, to be. It's, it's got to be serious. Well, thank you so thank much. You so it's much. Great, great having you. Hey, pick up this book. It's worth it. I mean, it's I mean, and if not, catch up on this podcast, and then you're going to end up buying a book because you're going to want all the inside of Grid Iron Genius.